Okay, you can hear me well? Perfect, it works. So, yeah, I realized that uh, um, Gabor is starting to introduce me when I heard my name, but that was the only thing that actually I understood, so I hope he didn't say any bad things about me. Eh? <laughs> uh, anyway, I would like to thank to Gabor and to Hungarian Federation for inviting me today here to talk to you, to share some perhaps ideas that will add some ideas for your job in your daily work. And uh, when we were talking about what could be the content of my presentations, and actually I asked first, uh, what is your theme of the conference? And he said it's the development of the 14 and under players. I said, great, and uh, I think that's really important because we all know that by the age, uh, end of this period, around 13, 14, if you have a good player, you have to make a big decision. Are you trying to go for the, let's call it professional tennis, or you will keep it like a, just a sport, let's say, for the player? And uh, actually everything, what we did between the start of the playing the, the game at the age of five, six nowadays in average, up to 13, 14, actually will be shown in the game that the players will then play at that age. Uh, we were talking also about what is interesting to talk about and uh, some of the things that I realize in my work as development officer around uh, Europe is that uh, very many uh, coaches are working very well in the technical area and actually are focusing very much and sometimes not really, uh, how to say, I would not say that they don't know, it's a more, more like uh, considering that players do the things that very often they don't do automatically. So that was the idea actually to talk to you today about more, I would call it perception and actually decision making in tennis, what is mostly related to the tactical part of the game. Actually the players always, of course they have their open eyes and they are picking up a lot of information during the game. And uh, some of the informations are proceed automatically during the game, during the point, and some of them are analyzed after, like opponent's patterns can be also uh, supported by some uh, statistical facts and uh, can be then brought back to the game. So that will be the topic of my first uh, presentation, how to actually look at perception, which are the elements of the perception for the pr players and actually how to include them in their actually decision-making process. And in the second part, later on during the uh, morning, as, uh, actually I will try to show you how to include this uh, perception, so perception of the uh, valid clues during the game in the decision making in terms of tactical development of the players. So basically, based on this what I just said, I dare to say that actually perception determines, determines your decisions in the game and mainly it's related to visual, even we know it's not only visual, it's kinesthetic also, but also hearing, uh, all these elements will influence the way that we perceive the game. Instead of talking too much, I would like to start with uh, one video clip. I hope we ne don't need exactly the, okay? Okay, I hope most of you will recall this, or rem are remembering this point, that was a semi-final match between Djokovic and Federer at US Open. It was a match point for Federer. You remember this one? So basically the question here is, was it a great tactical, I will call it reaction by, uh, by Djokovic or it was just a lucky shot? Uh, one more time, I will put it one more time for you. It's a serve, it's a match point. Feather is serving wide, and Joki, boom, hitting, return the winner. So, as I said, it's a question. Is it a lucky shot, or it's a great tactical, actually, decision? What we are actually talking here about is what we call total anticipation. What it means is that actually Djokovic was able to predict what Federer will do. Obviously that, that helped, him, helped him a lot. 
Uh, but that doesn't really ha happen very often. What really happened much more often is actually something what we call partial anticipation. What's happening in every point when the group players are playing with each other, actually when they actually hit the balls around and actually it seems like they're playing nice easy balls to each other. The reason why it looks easy between them is because they can very well predict what the opponents will not do. Basically by this prediction of what opponent will not do, they are narrowing the options that they are covering. That's very important and that's something what all of us that are playing tennis is doing intuitively. And that is actually what is, what is actually uh, bringing them to play the, at a, that level. It's possible because the top players are focusing on the valid clues, on the valid clues during the point. They're observing exactly at the right thing, the right clues in, o in order to pick up information and then use it in what I'm calling tactical reactions. Uh, I don't like to use tactical thinking because during the point you don't have time to think. You have to react. Basically you have to react. You don't have time to think. Yeah. So that's uh, the reason I'm using this word tactical reaction. So basically the question is what do the pros look at? What the pros look at? There are several things and I'm sure that all of you knows that perhaps that when I would now make a test, a list of six things what they are looking at, perhaps oops, some of you would forget too, but I'm sure that you are all in agreement that all the good players are looking and they are aware, oops, is it, okay, doesn't see, situation after own shot. So they are aware of what they did achieve with their own shot. They are actually looking at the opponent's preparation for their own shot. They are aware about and looking at the opponent's contact point early flight of the ball that uh, tells you the direction of the incoming ball, trajectory over the net, and of course own contact point. So now when we are talking about young players and we are coaches of young players, the question is how we as a coaches can recognize or how do we know that our players saw this? How we know as a coaches that our players saw this. Let's go one by one together. So situation after the own shot. I let you try to imagine how you know for your player. You are looking at me. <laughs> yeah, okay. Looking actually for optimal positioning according to the shot played. Very simple uh, example for you is that if I played a cross court, or if your coach, uh, sorry, if your player played the cross court, how do you know? Because he's covering the cross court a bit more than middle and down the line. Very simple, yeah. Opponent's preparation for the shot, adjusting position to the opponent's key features or preparation features. If I make a, 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 b a backswing like this, then all of you would think, "Oh, he is going for the big shot, or he will try to attack me." Of course, yeah. If I make like this. Drop shot, of course. These are the very simple examples that actually the players are recognizing actually by the opponent when they are preparing for the shot. Opponent's contact point, I think everybody is aware. Split step. The time split step actually is the, uh, is the thing that is showing us that our player really observed the opponent's contact point. Early flight of the ball. Basically, player can recognize the direction uh, uh, of the ball in the first three, four meters. And that's what we call early flight. But how do you recognize that? They call it also like asymmetric split step. Are you aware about this? What is this? That actually we know now that, that players are not coming with both feet at the same time like this, yeah? They're coming with actually the feet opposite of the direction of the movement first in order to push by landing, yeah? And actually when we can see that, that already before landing, they orientate the feet, that means that they recognize direction of the shot. Trajectory over the net. Okay, I here I didn't mention also previously, also early shoulder turn. Of course, that shows us. Uh, trajectory over the net, that means that they are adjusting their position 
basically before the ball bounced. Optimally, we would all like to see our younger players especially to be ready when the ball bounced, not to run after the ball, of course. And opponents, oh sorry, own contact point by keeping still head yeah, during the contact, not to look forward and then hit, what very often happens with the young players. So we have a lot of things to do. So basically, looking at the right clue at the right time actually is the secret of uh, professional players' ability to pick up the information and using them during the game. So they are really able to look at the right clue at the right time. And now in the next few minutes, I would like to try to convince you that they are really doing that. Oh, I believe you believe me, but I would like that we go together through actually what they are really doing. And for this, I have to change from PowerPoint to another program. You will see why in a second. Now I have to be very precise. Yes. Uh, we tested yesterday. It's possible to see everything what I will uh, uh, say you, especially if you don't need the glasses like me. In the first three, four rows, perhaps, at the, at the end of the, ro or the last rows, we might have a problem. So please, if you don't see, just come in front and take a look a little bit closer, okay? Uh, because uh, there are a few details that because of the size of the screen might be a little bit more difficult from the last rows. Uh, to be observed. So that's a point between Nadal and Djokovic, also US Open. And, uh huh, why it is not going? Okay. Perhaps yesterday I was able. Okay, I hope I. Yeah, okay. So I can also see it easier than if I am by the computer. So Djokovic is hitting. First serve. Now, my question for you, did actually Nadal observe uh, uh, Djokovic contact point? Just so show me with your finger, yes or no? Yes? How do you know it? But I show only, we see him actually, he's, oh, that's not a good, I will have to come. So basically you see that he's off the ground, that he actually he actually did Timed sp split step, he's off the ground. Ball is starting to fly. Now the ball is uh, around the service line. So it means that the ball flew around four meters. Now can you recognize the orientation of the feet? That's, that was the, one of the elements actually that I know it's not so easy to recognize. But the guys at the first row, can you help me? Can you see that actually Nadal's left foot is already showing to the left side? Yeah, so they, try they, s they can see it. For you guys, it's more difficult. And they can already see that the right foot is, of course, going a little bit outside. So already in these few meters, it's a confirmation that Nadal saw the direction of the serve. And now by landing, you can see that he's pushing from the right foot. He's lefty, of course, yeah? So that's... And he's moving to the ball. This was uh, around 185 up there, but it's also a little bit small. 185 ki kilometer fast serve. Nadal is hitting the ball. Is Djokovic aware about outcome of his serve? Yes or no? Just show me. Hmm. Just a few. The others are not sure. Are you sure or not? Where he's staying after the ser first serve? Inside the court. So that actually tells you, yes, he's aware that it was a good serve and he's staying in the very offensive position. Look at Nadal now. He hits the ball. In which direction he's moving? Backwards. Does it confirm to you that he's aware about the quality of his return? Of course, yes. He's aware that he played neutral ball and actually he's positioning himself backwards to give him a bit more time. So he was immediately after hitting the ball aware about his situation and adjusting his position accordingly. Ball is flying to the other side. Nadal is adjusting. Now, a question for you. 
Where, the, where the actually Djokovic will hit his next shot? Down the line or cross court? Who is for cross court? Bring up, the, bring up your hand, hand. Who is for cross court? <laughs> okay, come on. Who is for cross court? Okay. The rest for down the line? Is it true? Okay. One for down, only one shows. Okay, I consider that the rest is for the down the line. Let's see what he will do. And actually, now, without telling you, when you look at Nadal, what do you think that he thinks? Down the line or cross court? When you now observe da uh, Nadal, Nadal thinks it's a down the line. Let's see if Nadal is good in predicting. <laughs> and he's for actually positioning himself. But there is one more thing here that is very interesting. How Nadal is adjusting his position? In which direction? In which direction? Can you show me? Backwards, forwards? Forward, yeah? He's moving already forward. What it means for, for you now when you think about what he's expecting? Short wall. But when we look at Federer, I would not say. <laughs> Obviously, that's the reason that I was not winning Grand Slams and Nadal did, yeah? So this, he, he is better in seeing the things. And it's true. The Djokovic will play. Now, look at because the ball is not even hit. The ball is bouncing, and Nadal is already moving forward. He was exactly anticipating. And you see that even prior to the contact point, he was able to already push from the left foot hit the ball, uh, sorry, and by contact point, running forward. Because of that, Djokovic drop shot looks like a very bad shot. Nadal is running forward, of course, immediately. What Djokovic is doing? Moving back. He immediately realized, oops, sorry, shit. <laughs> the guy saw it, he's moving forward, and Djokovic is moving back. When you now, now look at Djokovic's preparation, what do you think, what he is expecting as a Nadal's shot? Down the line or cross court? Cross court. From, from this position, is it easier to run to the, be, uh, to the down the line or to the cross court? What do you think? Down the line, yeah, he, but it's, it's easier to, than to go there. So basically, he's looking at, actually, what is important here to say, he's looking at Nadal, and he's anticipating down the line shot perhaps because of his closed shoulders. And actually, Nadal is coming to the ball, and he's even more emphasizing positioning of, the, or, or for hi of him uh, actually for covering down the line. Moving even to the down the line, but nothing, something else happened. Nadal is hitting cross court. Nadal is hitting cross court. But there are two things that at this moment you can actually recognize and what I want to emphasize. First of all, the ball is not over the net, but you can already be sure that, na that Djokovic saw it. You saw his left foot, yeah? He's already landing on left foot. So th as, as we said, that is a confirmation that he saw the direction of the ball. Another thing is, even by looking at the right thing at the right time, even the top players will not always predict right, because the other guy tried to camouflage this, this guy. So that's always a game, yeah? Otherwise it would be too predictable. But importantly, he really look at that clue. Yes, perhaps he will not also make always the right decision, but he is looking there. It gives him a chance. And there is one more important thing. It was a great shot by Nadal, great angle. But look at the result. Result is 15 all in the first game of the match that can last for four hours. I am pretty confident to say that if this would be a set ball, that we would see Djokovic already, he would try to move to the ball. He had a chance. If he would win the point or not, that doesn't matter at the moment, yeah, what we are talking about. But uh, at, the right, at the key point, when he will be fully warm up, Djokovic for sure will try to reach, you know, when he's sometimes very stretched and bring another impossible ball back, make you 
to hit another shot, what is so difficult thing, yeah? After great shot, to make another great shot mentally, right? <laughs> so I hope I was able to convince you in two things, that really the pro players are looking at the, these valid clues and actually they're aware about them, include them in their decision making, but it doesn't mean that uh, they will always make the right decision because the other guy also tried to hide it. We know that all. Very good. So let's move back. Oops. And another question that is very important is how do the players lear learn it? Is it innate actually ability that you get by genes or is it something that you develop? Actually, there were several um, researches and some of them have been done by the psychologists. One that I will also present some kind of the outcome or summary of these uh, conclusions by the psychologists was done by the guy who was a psychologist for the Israeli, Israeli, Israeli Air Force. You can imagine that the pilots have to have very quick decisions. <laughs> By 2,000 kilometers per hour fly, you have to decide to shoot or not, not too much time to think. So what did they found out is that the experts in any area, so also experts in tennis, actually learn to recognize the patterns and connect them with these valid clues. They, re they learn to recognize the patterns. In order to do that, there are several things that have to come together. First one is that they have enough time to learn in repeatable conditions. I will take just one very simple example for you. Repeatable condition is serving. Players come, always have his uh, like a ritual and will be do the serving. So that means repeatable condition. Another thing is that they're focusing on valid clues. If there are no valid clues in some situation, then it's just a guess. Okay? So what is the one valid clues by serve in terms of what type of serve will come that we are all using? It's toss. We all look at the toss. Yes, the other guy tried to disguise by trying to make at least as possible the ch uh, differences, but we are all looking at the toss. This is one valid clue in terms of uh, actually uh, recognizing the type of serve. Third element is that they see immediately the consequences. If there are no immediate consequences, then what the psychologists find out, then our brain will not connect. The clue with the consequence will not learn. So just to, to take the, uh, the toss, so if I hit the, the ball to the side, we all know that more probably it will come slice, so then if it is to the left, most probably will come the top spin. And our brain learns it, actually, if we have a chance to recognize that this and this and this and this are some kind of relationship. If there is no relationship and we cannot learn it immediately or see it immediately, it will be difficult to learn from this, uh, what we see. And there is one more really important element, and that's uh, selective attention. Instead of trying to explain it, I will use one video clip here. And actually, what I will ask you to do, and I will explain first because explanation is in English so that you, that you are ready when it starts. You, I will ask you to look at the video clip that will take not longer than one minute. And uh, you will be asked to count how many passes by the ball the team in white t-shirt did during the video clip, okay? The, there will be players in the white and the black t-shirt, and I would like you to count how many passes have been done during the video clip bet between the players in the white t-shirt. Okay? Understood? It will be one more time explained. <coughs> Start. Look at the players that wi in white t-shirts and count how many times they will pass the basketball to each other. The ball is at the lady. Pass it one one to the other guys in the white. Where is this ball? How many times they pass? So? 15? Oh. 
passes, 15 passes, but actually that was not the task. Did you see the gorilla? According to the, that's a test by the psychologist, around 80% or more people don't see the gorilla when they look at it first time. And that's actually because we were focusing us on white shirts, because of that I was misleading you and asking, look at the white shirts guys. The consequence is if you are not really focusing, let's say on this, but really focusing on the toss, you will not learn anything out of it because you, your brain actually didn't connect it, didn't, didn't see it. Because of that, it's very important when we are developing these perception skills by the players that they really are focused on these clues that are valid for the particular situation. And there will be some things that I will try to show you now during some drills also how to link this and how to connect it. This is very important. And I hope that some of you really didn't see the gorilla because then I was able to convince you. Because you see that the gorilla is coming in the middle, even hit him on the chest. But if you don't look at him, we will not really see him. So there are five group of clues that the players are using. Incoming ball characteristics, opponent's position, own position, preparation clues, and basically knowing your opponent's weapons and patterns, oh, also, also weaknesses if you wish to put it here. So these are all the clues that are helping us to make decisions what we will hit, what kind of the shot, what we want to achieve with the next shot. So now the question for you is, and I would like you to, that you, you can uh, find a, a colleague of yours next to you in pairs or in threes, and I will give you one minute, and I have one task for you. I will not ask you what you said to each other, but I would like you to set to really to set to each other to think a little bit. But the question is the following. In which order the players, but players from the age of seven to let's say 17, during these 10 years are able to include different clues in their decision-making process? So I'm not asking how you use the clues. How do you think that the kids from the age of six, seven, when they start, up to the 17, when they can play top tennis or, or the professional tennis, are able to include the different clues in, this, in their decision-making process? You understand the question? I give you one minute. Talk to your colleague. One minute. I would like just to hear a buzz that you are talking to each other. I will not ask anybody to tell me what you said. Come on. One minute for you. And these are the clues that I just remind you, yeah? In which order? What would be the first group of clues that kids can use, perhaps? What would be the second one? I would like that you to hear that you talk to each other. Come talk to each other. <laughs> Tell to each other what you think. I will not ask. Okay. Usually it takes uh, one or two minutes to start talking. It will be interesting to put in front of you the votes and to see how, how you will vote. Nevertheless, I will share with you my proposal. So, the first group of the, uh, of the clues that first the kids naturally are using is incoming ball. They have to see the ball. If the ball comes to the forehand or to the backhand, they have to just react to this. But now it's interesting, what did you put as a second group of clues? The or second clue that players can involve in their decision making. My proposal is opponent's position. Some of you are noting, some not. So most probably the ones that are not noting put own position. Why put actually opponent's position first and not own position? For very simple reason. The kids can comprehend what they see. And opponent's position is something what is concrete information. My own position, I don't see, I imagine. So it's actually more abstract information for which kids need to grow up. If you would ask the kids to consider 
that when they're inside the court to play angle shots, when they're to behind the baseline to play deep shots, they will not be able to really do that. They will not be able to also understand why. That's something that needs to be a little bit time. Typically, the kids are able mentally to include own position around the age of 10, around. Most probably, if you have Martina Hingi, she was able to do it also earlier. <laughs> but she was exception from the regular uh, development, let's say, of the kids. Next one, preparation clues. Actually, preparation clues of the opponent. The kids need when the ball starts to be so fast that you cannot react after the contact point. And basically that happens when the kids start to grow up at the age of 14, 15, they start really to be able to hit fast shots. At the age of 9, 10, they, they're not, do the, do, no, not doing that, so also the, on the other side, you don't really have a need for it. And when they're getting older, they're able to include also in their planning and decision making like Djokovic was able to do actually his uh, understanding of the opponent's strengths and playing patterns. Coming back to this video, we all know that Federer likes to hit a, a wide serve. Why? Because then it's difficult to hit the return to his backhand. And he's also always very offensive when it comes to the big point. So based on these two things, it's logical that also uh, that Djokovic did, a, I would call it calculated risk. He covered a bit more the side that he's expecting that probability that he will serve first serve is higher and then he was trying to be offensive in order to prevent opponent to play his best game or favorite game so when you're looking when you're looking backward Djokovic decision was uh, not luck it was based on a lot of experience but also it was possible because of full confidence awareness and actually, if he would be able to hit such a good shot nine out of the ten time, I doubt. But this one time counted. <laughs> but it was not just the lucky shots. It was many things involved. So I'm starting now to go to the practical part in 20, 25 minutes, I promise to you. <laughs> and I will show you some very simple drills that you can start to do already at a very early age because all the kids, when we bring them on court, we first of all want them to be able to, to actually uh, create a, co a rally between each other, to do cooperative rally, we call it. Yeah? And for this, what they need to, uh, to see as the clues are direction, trajectory of the incoming ball, and the last one that you cannot see, own contact point to control the ball. Okay? So the idea how to help the players that cannot do it by playing, by just uh, experience playing, is example of this uh, Thank you. of this shot. This is not my player. I was just uh, asking her to help me. Aha. Uh -huh. When she said backhand, when the ball was passing already the bar. Forehand. Here actually is very simple example of what we were just talking before. There is a valid clue. It's a bar and actually trajectory of the ball by the bar. So actually, typically the kids, when they are young, they are waiting for the ball to bounce and then start to, start to move. And by this setup, you are actually shifting their focus from bouncing that they try to pick up the clues before, at the, during the flight. And you remember when I said there should be also immediate feedback. So this bar is giving to the player immediate feedback if he saw it right or wrong. And then actually the, the, the brain can start to connect actually this trajectory and actually where the ball will come. I'm asking her also to say, I will show you also for trajectory uh, in terms of height. I'm trying to ask her, knees come in low, Visto come in high, yeah, over the bar. And of course, when she said Visto, she has to move backwards, so she's connecting a reaction, the movement with something what she sees. Oops, <laughs> doesn't matter. But actually, very simple example how you can apply this, what we were just talking about, how the top players learn in actually the drills if your player need the help. I would like to emphasize 
if the player need the help, if player is moving well, reacting well, don't, don't use DC drills, just play. <laughs> but if the player cannot, then actually we as a coaches, in order to accelerate the learning, we have to have the tools, the drills that will help such players to develop quicker. I think that is our job. And the last thing related to the contact point with young kids, the guy is five and a half, and ask him to hit the different balls. And basically what I wanted him to realize is that, th that he sees the ball through the, through the strings, yeah? So have some picture, uh -huh, uh -huh, that's a contact point. And a hit here, 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 yeah? So that he has some kind of the picture. And then I'm asking him to do that with the ball. Choop. And if the player really looks through the string, there will be one also technical conf uh, consequence. He will hit in front of him without telling him what is in front. Because if he wants to hit the, uh, see the ball through, he will hi hit it in front. One thing that I'm be I believe you have also realized, uh, he didn't do it perfectly. The, b the first one was the best. After that, he was letting the ball low. And then basically, he opened the racket face. And here you didn't uh, hear, but I asked him, do you see the ball through the string or on the string? Yeah, now you see on, now you can see through. So basically also through such, uh, I would say, awareness and actually focusing on the perception, you can very much influence actually technique because technique is directly also connected to the way that we perceive and how we actually move according to what we see. When the kids are a bit better, they already compete in the, uh, in the red court and ac actually they're trying to play away from the opponent. Yeah, in order to move the opponent, they try to play away. What is happening here, and actually what they need to include in order to do that is, first of all, they have to be able to, to be aware about the opponent. In order to play away from the opponent, you have to be aware where he is, yeah? And opponent's contact point. You don't, I don't know why it is not inside, it's a bit small, <laughs> but it's opponent contact point. Opponent's contact point is very important, basically, that they start to also cover the court well, and it's actually related to the technical element of split step. But basically, if you would think tactically, it's related to the covering of the court. If you don't see the opponent contact point, most probably you will start to react when the ball is over the net, and it's too late. We all know that. <laughs> uh, one very simple drill, and I will ask my players and the coach uh, that will help me to come in front, these two players, uh, can be Attila and Zolan. Actually, very simple drill for the players to show you actually that they see the opponent. As you see, I'm moving to one from one side to the other, and she should play actually in the open court. Very simple drill. That's connecting actually control of direction with actually the purpose of playing away from the opponent. They can go on court and just have a few hits because we will start in two mi three minutes. Thank you for helping me. And actually, kids are developing very quickly. They are coming then quickly from seven to eight. They have started to play on orange court. And already here, they are what I call the level of the game using open space. The difference between using space and playing away is that when the kids are six, seven, they are playing sh one shot in the time without playing, uh, planning ahead. By this level, at the age of eight, they can already plan. I hit to the forehand in order to create space on the backhand. Okay, so that's a qualitative difference. And here, actually, they should be able to include early ball flight, and I'm missing a little bit. Uh, actually, it's uh, when, actually, the timing of the split step to cover the court. But the main thing is early ball flight. Otherwise, they start to be too late. One drill that I will uh, actually show you on the here on the screen, and then I will show you one adaptation uh, on, uh, on the court. Uh, can you now, Gabor, can you bring this uh, banner behind and just move this outside so that they can see better the court? Thank you very much. Um, so one the very simple thing that also I will show you here is how to practice the players to see the early ball flight. 
When the ball is passing on the right, she should play backhand. I ask cross court when actually the ball is flying on the left side of the bar, she sh and actually he has to stay. By saying to me, actually, before the ball crossed the net, I know that he saw it at the right time. Yeah. Backhand. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so what is the difference? The difference is actually the thing that very often what we do as a coach is we put the lines on the other side, on the floor, and ask the player, play all the balls that are right, yeah, with, uh, with your forehand, and the left with the backhand. What typically players are doing, they are waiting for the ball to bounce. Instead of actually make early decisions, they are waiting to see where the ball will bounce. With this approach, you will shift their decision earlier. Early decision makes you actually oh, makes play, uh, bring play player more time. Now, I will go back. Now I will use my players, actually, mostly, to show the drills. And there is one drill I want to show you. OK. Uh, OK, can you stop? Zolan, can you help me? Because I, th I already explained to Zolan what I will do. Uh, I need two balls. So this, what I will show you now, is a drill that you can do with the kids that are six year old, when, when they are very young. Uh, Zolan, you, no, you will play with racket now, but in order to imitate that you are a kid, you can try a few and you will try a few balls, you will play with your wrong hand, with left, okay? And imitate, you will stay here. Imagine that we have a, a, red co a red court here, we are playing over the red net. I will ask now the Zolan and after that Attila, Everybody, everybody will make four shots. You will be behind him. Uh, stay, stay on the side, and then when he finishes, you change. Uh, so you will have to tell me when I'm hitting the ball, if I'm hitting with the black or red, red side. But try to be loud that they can hear you, OK? Yeah. Very good. Next one. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so very simple drill. If you create anything like this, what ha has a different size for the kids, it's a funny game. But actually, what, that will, what we will create is actually the focus on the contact point. And you can use this simple thing, a uh, simple approach already from the age of, believe me, six, no problem. These guys that you saw that in the video clip, we did it. And they were laughing, focusing actually on the contact point without any problem because it was done in a way that they can actually apply it. Now, by the players at this uh, level, and I will thank now Attila and Zolan one more time to for helping me. Okay, we will. Uh, can you bring me this uh, bar from there? Uh, what is your name? You didn't, Adrian. Can you bring me this bar? And you guys, you will be on the other side. Ah, we have it here. Okay. Uh, Adrian, you will t take some balls, and you guys will go to the other side. Actually, you should send. We don't have the same what they have at home with the bigger. I hope he sends. Okay, no, no, take the whole, all the whole basket. Okay, I have to move it a little bit more. Okay. You are returning, one and then the other. Uh, Adrian, yeah? Adrian, you can return, you can serve to the T or to the side. Try not to hit it. <laughs> Try not to be so precise today. And you guys, I would like it th that you tell me if the ball is coming to your backhand or to your forehand before the ball crosses the net. You understand? So when he hits before the ball crosses the net, you say backhand. And if you say backhand, that means you play to the backhand side. If you say forehand, you play to the forehand. OK? Each of you have four, sir, four returns. Mm. 
When did you say it? Before the ball crossed the net. Be like Djokovic. Uh huh. One more. A bit louder. Okay. Change. Ah, when did you say forehand? You were saying when you were hitting. You have to say before the ball crossed the net. Okay? Uh huh. Okay. But the, uh, back in that you play with forehand. Okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Now, change one more time. We'll make one more round. Now, I can also motivate them actually to say it earlier by creating some kind of competition. So I will, you will get for every, uh, every time when you say the right side of the, uh, sorry, the right shot, forehand or backhand, you get one point for yourself. But when the ball is passing, I will clap so that we know that you are actually saying before or later. Are you ready? Mm, no point. Aha, uh -huh. one point for you. Two more. Ah, good. Perfect. <laughs> okay, anyway, <laughs> put it away. It was Murphy's law. If I would ask him to hit it, most probably he would not be able to hit. Okay, we will not do it. Thank you very much, guys. Can you f just uh, take a few balls? Let's take it out. Don't, don't worry. Take it out. It's enough. We don't need it. Doesn't matter. I think you got the idea. We don't need now to practice it a lot. Yeah? So basically, if you want them to give her, that they also learn this immediate feedback, it's not enough just to say, say, say earlier. Give them some kind of the uh, concrete guidelines. So if you make a clap when the ball is over the net, they know if it is before or later. Thank you very much. Okay, now the next level actually that now especially let's say we have an exam. Why it is not working? Okay, I have to put it back. You. Can you put me on back on the screen? <laughs> okay. Um, now you can see the Zoltan. Actually, these are the exactly the guys that are like you. They are actually one year younger than you. I don't. It doesn't work. Actually, okay, I hope it is. Because what I will show you, there's the final of the match, actually at the 12 and under tournament in array, one of the strongest 12 and under competitions in, in Europe. And you see two players, one is from Croatia and Ser one from Serbia playing the match. Actually, at this age already, the players are really playing great tennis. They move each other, they construct the point well, and actually, they are able to really uh, play almost like a pros. What they are able to do actually here is they are in addition to move the opponent, they are able to take the time away from the opponent. Especially you will see it now by when you're looking at the girls. You all know that nowadays they are all playing a lot of uh, dry volleys in order to continue the pressure. Ah, come up. And she's coming in, hitting the ball with the dry volleys. So hitting on the rise playing dry volleys and all this what I call offensive technique or technical power is a part of the actually, uh, how to say, uh, repertoire that the best players are having. In order, oh, actually in order to do that, they have to actually add some more qualities in terms of including uh, awareness about additional clues. And one of this is opponent's contact point qualities and actually own position plus actually they should be able to already consider their own uh, uh, own position on the court so first thing I will show you now with one uh, video clip how to actually practice with the players opponents con uh, to recognize opponents contact point qualities I like it because it's a very nice video clip and I have a permission from Canadian Tennis Federation to show it to you I
Okay. Okay, you understand? I will ask you to do it also. Okay, hit. Stop. Okay. Okay, so be you understood. This is, they call it trouble bubble. When the ball is high or low and player is stretched, or actually when you hit into his bu uh, body, he's in trouble. And very often young players don't see that. They don't react actually to, uh, to this uh, situation, how the opponent is hitting the ball. So uh, you see them? I, you understand what is the point? Perfect. So you will play to each other. Uh, can you just, Adrian, take the balls away? Uh, Okay, Zolan, you can stay here. Attila, you can go to the other side. Good. I will even stop here. They get it. Okay. Uh, okay, you can start from, from down. We don't wait, 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 wait. Just to explain. Okay, first shot, you hit back to him. After that, you can play on the whole court. And actually, when you see him in trouble, that actually the, he has to hit the ball up, stretch, low, or here, you have to say trouble, and after that you have to try to take a lead, or actually to benefit on this, uh, b let's say, bad position for your opponent. Let's see how they will do that. Trouble, yes, perfect, excellent. One more point. Don't be so nice to him, yeah? <laughs> if you want to bring him in trouble, you have to move him around or to play different shots. Uh -huh. Okay, come on. No problem. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Uh -huh. Attila is too nice. I would now coach him, perhaps. Or can you bring him a ball up above his, uh, above his uh, shoulder on backhand? Difficult, can you? Come on, try. With the first shot, try to create this. Ah, it's not above the shoulder. Uh -huh. he's <laughs> ah, now we have a very different thing. Come on, try to bring it up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's it. Still not? Uh -huh. Yes, move him. Trouble. You should, okay. So you can even give to every player his own like a specific task and they have to try to create this actually by the opponent what will actually make them think about it. And they will be starting really to focus on this very simple but important elements in terms of actually perception and related decision in the game. Okay. Uh, now we move forward, uh, actually you can stay here and um, Adrian, can you take just a few balls, you can leave or take everything, uh, take, all, take all the balls with you, that should be easier. As I said, it's important for the players at this age when they are already 12, 13, that they really start to be aware about their own position. And, and you're on the other side, Adrian, you're on the other side, you will also play with them, okay? I, I, I will explain. Uh, you are staying in the forehand corner, actually in the forehand side, and Adrian, you, say you take the ball, you are playing from the back end. Now what I want you to consider is, and this is one drill that you can do by every warm up. We all know that uh, the players standing, when they are warming up, they don't think, hitting the ball. And very often as a coach, we, we say, don't hit hard, focus, but we very often don't help them what to focus on. So I will try to help now, Zoland. Zoland, when you play the balls, any kind of the ball that comes to you, to, uh, to Attila, basically he's in his forehand corner, where you are t usually t trying to position yourself after hitting the ball in the forehand corner? Position yourself in the middle, left, right? 
So you play to him and then you open him the cross court. Ah, uh, uh, exactly, yeah? So when you hit the ball to him, you position yourself more to cover the cross court, yeah? If you would play to Adrian, there, if it comes to the middle, you're in the middle. Now you play one ball left, one, uh, one ball right, but always cover the court according to the uh, direction where the ball was hit. Come on. Yes. Ooh. Try to play to the middle. You are not playing. You are not moving him around. <laughs> I didn't say. You are playing back to the middle. Yeah. Okay. And cover. Yeah. It's more like warm up. Very good. Where you are standing. Very good. That's middle. Middle. Yep. In the middle. You are in the middle. So now cover. Yes. good actually but this very simple drill you are practicing this awareness of actually covering the court according to my short direction we can put it also a little bit different uh, now can you put Adrian two lines in a way that I will put it here and they will play with each other look can you take another line so put it around one meter behind uh, here okay. uh, one meter a bit more one meter. Ah. Can you put for Attila also in the middle the, the line like this? It's around one meter behind the baseline. So Attila and Zolan, you are playing to each other through the middle. Okay? If you feel that you hit the ball deep, that will be difficult for your, uh, for your partner. Actually, I would like you to make a split step in front, so close to the baseline. Okay? If you feel that you play neutral ball, that he will have a chance, I would like you to make a split step behind, okay? So consider your positioning in terms of depth, yeah? What actually Nadal did by being aware about the quality of the own shot. Let's try. Okay, good. One more. Try to keep the good quality of the shot through the middle. If it's deep, yes, come on. Uh -huh. If it's deep, stay forward, yeah? So stay close to the line. Stay close, don't go back. Come on, Attila. Yeah, uh huh. Mm -hmm. hmm. But now he stays all the time close, yeah? Now my question is. What means actually that you hit the difficult shot for him? It means that he will be pressed by the ball. It's not only depth. It should be speed and depth together. You have to feel if, if you just hit an easy ball, he will hit back deep to you. Yeah. So be aware about quality. If you really press him, then go forward. If not, so create uh, some kind of space behind. Come on, and hit. That's a neutral. Yes. Uh -huh. That was close. Very good. That's good. Okay, perfect. Doesn't matter. Thank you. Very important element because at the age of 14 already the top players all are trying to establish offensive position close to the line. But that means that they, they also understand when they can do it. If your ball is not uh, good quality so that the ball is not coming actually neutral, let's say from the other side, you have to stay back. Understanding this actually and connecting with your positioning is in my opinion one, uh, one of the things that distinguish the top players, let's say top 20, 30 at the IT, uh, Tennis Europe ranking from let's say already 40, 50. One thing that you will see that the best players just do already automatically. They see it and they do that uh, correctly. Okay. Um, another element of the position in terms of positioning uh, in the terms of uh, including my position in the decision-making process is exactly about this uh, offensive positioning in the court. So I will ask you, you guys, if you are staying, let's say two meters behind the baseline, where is it for you good to aim for on the other side? But where, where you would like to hear, to play? he said difficult, yeah? You would, uh, when you are staying behind, you can hit to the middle, or you can hit what? 
deep cross cut. But when you are staying inside the court, or angle, angle. So actually, we'll make the similar practice. Just one example. Uh, okay, who will be here? Okay, Attila, you are here now. Can you guys come with me? Can you, Attila, take out these two lines, please? Take out the lines. And we'll put these two lines on this side. It's very simple. <coughs> okay. You like to play backhand or forehand side? Pick up. You are, you're the boss. You play forehand or backhand? Backhand, you play forehand. Okay. Let us make it like this. Just put it uh, uh, on the other side. Yeah. Okay. A bit inside. A little bit inside. Okay. So, if you are... If you have to play the balls that you are staying outside of the court, I would like you to play deep cross-court shots, means inside, yeah? When you are staying in the, in the court, I would like you to aim outside. One ball, ball left, one ball right. You are playing back to the middle, yeah. You are playing back to the middle. We make a simple drill in terms of playing back to the middle. Yeah? Yes? When it's Come on. Stop, 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 stop. If you are staying outside of the, of the court, aim for the deep cross court. When you are inside, then I would like you to go for the angle cross court, okay? Yes. Now come in. That's it. That's it. Okay, uh huh. Very good. Yes. Yes, they they give you easy balls. Use it. Very good. Come on, come on, come. On. Yes. Now. Uh huh. Okay. Now that was a risky shot. <laughs> okay. Try to give him some difficult balls. Yeah, not only easy balls that he can always be inside. Try to change. He has to see. It. Okay, yes, keep deep, very good, come on, keep deep, uh -huh. Ooh. come on, uh -huh. what you are aiming for, when it's a difficult shot, aim for the, more to the middle, yeah, don't go for the line, so be aware where you are standing, yes, yes, very good. Huh? Very good. And now, come on, come on. Ooh. At 18 and under, the guy would be already in the court. He would use this neutral shot, yeah? It doesn't need to be uh, easy ball. Okay, anyway, that's something to be practiced. Please, can you uh, pick up the balls? Uh, please, yeah, take some balls from this side too. Now, can you bring me back on the screen? I would like to show... One more thing. I mean, the, my presentation, not me. <laughs> okay. At the age of 14, 15, the best players are already able to, as you know, to uh, the, they're able to play the they are able to play 18 and under tournaments. So it's, uh, it's a pleasing, uh, actually it's a continuous development. When the players start to play at that level of international I, uh, 18 and under tournaments, basically they're entering this level that they call imposing game style. They're able to impose their own, ga own game, style, game style, not only having it, yeah? So basically to do that, they start to actually include also additional clues, opponent's early clues, preparation clues, recognition of the opponent's patterns, attention flow, actually to move their actually focus from one element to the other during the, uh, during the point, like actually we saw that the top players can do. So basically, I would like to share a few drills related to this what you are starting to develop already from the age of 13, 14, when we are talking about the, the best, best players. Because if you start to do it at the age of 18, it's too late. Then you have to have it in the game. So 
what have you what we will do okay one very simple drill for you uh, actually Adrian you will play with each of them okay at the rally you guys will be here and you will play one rally each with Adrian Adrian you will show them by your preparation you will show you will show you will do your preparation with closed racket or open racket and you uh, immediately when you see how Adrian is uh, preparing the racket, I want to you to tell me loud, close, open. You can say it in English or it's, it's okay for you. Okay, good. Very simple thing, of course, to anticipate what kind of the shot is coming. Is it the flies or let's say topspin shot? Very simple thing. Now we are trying this one example how to actually practice with kids to prepare and to, to start to pick up the clues before the contact. Okay, ready? Yep. After the first shot. Okay, now, you tell me. Oh, before he, he hits. <laughs> Stop, Th you didn't say anything. Okay, when, you, when he doesn't say anything, that, he, that means for me that his concentration was fading away. Doesn't matter, change. <laughs> so, can, can you, I will, I will do once only, look. Can you hit the ball to me? So open. Close. Close. Open. Okay, so, but try to show them. When, when you make in the, in the middle, then they will wait for you to show. So to try to show them, when you start moving back, Make, uh, make to uh, give early sign, let's say, that so that they can, re they can really see it. Let's do it. Okay. Very good. Oh, good. Okay. One more. Very good. And he was already loud, so you could hear when he's saying. Try to be louder, Attila, yeah? Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, thank you. Obviously, I can now ask if I would be there that they cannot hear me. Perhaps I would ask him when you open the racket play play a drop shot to see if they really see that but we don't need to do that now because they know it so it's not it's not fun anymore so that's a very simple way now i will try to make something what is much more difficult can you come a bit closer let's see who has eagle eye now adrian try to play forehand and uh, can you stay here that they can see what i will show basically i will ask uh, uh, adrian now when you're making preparation when you move either you bring your f uh, finger away or you leave it here but no make it basically before you start so that they have a chance because if you make it here they will not be able to see so here okay or, or without and when you when you see then you say yes if you don't see don't say anything okay but when you see they say yes okay come on let's see Thank you. Perfect. Other guy. <laughs> come on, come on. Did he, did he do it? Yes. He opened. You, most probably, his focus was not there. He was thinking something else at the moment. Doesn't matter. But actually, that shows me most probably he was looking something else. Actually, is it important to see this finger? No. But here, actually, 
I, I'm starting to also show you one element that is also interesting in the whole story, is that what we call, um, we have uh, two types of learning. One is explicit, when you know what you are learning, and one is like implicit learning, when the player even doesn't know what he's learning. Basically, by focusing on, on this finger, what you actually li uh, want him to focus on is the posi position of opponent's hand. Because if the ball is here and my hand is here, what type of the direction you can expect? Cross court. If he sees behind, most probably it comes down the line. If it, if it starts to speak about it, you will kill the player. But if he sees and he learns from this actually connection between the position of the hand and what is the outcome, he has a chance to be one of the guys like this top pros that just, like Nadal, he, they just smell it. You cannot think about it, you can smell it. But it's uh, because they're looking at the right clue. Another interesting th uh, thing that you can also in, th in the same way try to work with players if they need is the following. Now I will ask you to distinguish in your preparation. You put regular or you make a big backswing, okay? And when you see a big backswing, you tell me yes. And be ready actually that he attacks you. When you make a big backswing, you can attack him, uh, attack them, okay? And that means that you can play away. When you are making uh, regular swings, you play to the middle. But when you are preparing backswing, you can go for cross court down the line to attack them. Okay. Okay, good. Just say loud yes when you see the ba big backswing. Okay. Huh? Good. Say one more time, Zol Zolan. Zolan, one more time. Okay, thank you. Now, there's one thing. First time, actually, Zon was not really uh, using immediately this implicit learning. Perhaps he, uh, he needs some more time, of course. Because the drill that I show you now is it was a test that they did actually in one research. And what they found out when you ask the players actually to observe, uh, uh, let's say, the preparation size, that would mean that they observe how, s b how strong the shot will come to them. Implicitly or intuitively, they start to actually better predict direction of that shot. Without even thinking about that, but obviously when you are looking at the position of your shoulders and hips, that also gives you the idea about possible direction of the shot, without even thinking about that. The less the player think, and that they actually develop it intuitively, it's better. We know that because then you need less time. So these are actually very important elements. Uh, two more. One is uh, about contact point and actually how good you see the contact point. Before I a little bit practice with them to make them aware and uh, when they were actually practicing with each other, uh, warm up, warming up, I asked them, Can, do you really w uh, look at opponent's contact point? And they said, yes. But after when I asked them, okay, but where, when I asked Attila where uh, Zolan is hitting the balls, he couldn't tell me. So basically he was looking around, but not with selective attention. When, I, when he really was focusing, he realized that Zolan is playing many balls here, not so much in the middle. Doesn't matter, yeah. <laughs> but then we agree that it's quite good to hit it with the middle with the sweet spot. Now, actually, I will ask them to do the following thing. Uh, you will try now to see it. Zolan will serve, and you guys will first not try to do anything else than actually tell with which, with which 
position of the on the racket, he was hitting the serves. You are saying here, Zoran will be on the other uh, Sorry, no, no, no. You are both saying here. And uh, Adrian, you are serving from the other side. Zoran, you are here. So can you give me one ball, Adrian? Can you give me one ball? Because you are staying on, on the side, it will be difficult for you. But what I'm asking them to see if the ball is in the middle, if the ball is here, here, that they actually really focus on the contact point and recognize with which part of the racket face Adrian will hit the serve. Okay? You are standing next to each other. Okay? And stay next to each other. Uh, next to each other. Both? Okay? Now, you will hit, try to hit flat serves. It's easier for them. And when he is hitting the serve, immediately when he hits the serve, you can tell me, middle, up, down. Okay, try to go. Middle, up, down. Left, right, we will not, uh, it will be too complicated. Okay? Come on. Uh -huh. Up. It was up. And uh, Attila was seeing uh, middle, yeah? Let's, let's, pr let's practice it. Let's say middle is here, okay? We have to, so the in this part, we say up, middle, down, okay? Like a three-thirds. We have to agree on this, what we are calling up. Very good. Up, uh-huh. Zolan is much more sure. Right? And there is one thing. I'm quite sure that I can help the thing. And they are intuitively do the things differently. And they don't know. Uh, but next time you will try with the whole serve. One of the tricks that they also found out when they did the research with the top returners is basically that the top returners are not following up to the highest spot, the ball, by the toss. When the ball is going up, they are keeping the focus in the contact point. What I believe that happens to you, Attila, that basically you're following the, up, the, the ball up in the highest point, and then when the ball comes down, he doesn't see the contact point really clearly. So now try to, if this is my contact point, yeah? So when the ball goes up, try to keep the ball, the, the eyes here. Don't follow the ball up. Okay, you understand? Oh, uh, uh, don't go up, yeah? Keep it here. You, okay? So that you really can see the ball on, the, on his racket face. Let's try it. Okay? Let's see now. Where it was? That's middle. That's up. That's middle, that's down. Okay. And you say also, Zolan, what you see loudly to the guys that they can hear you. Come on. Up. Good. One more. Try to keep your eyes in the contact. Up. So, okay, good. The key thing you cannot see because you're not behind is that you focus the attention to keep the, and to actually stay with the eyes in the height of the contact, don't go up. So when it really happens that you can, what they call it, fixate. Because otherwise you are too late. Okay, huh? that was not, not a bad one. Okay, and now, the, actually the last drill, actually shifting the focus. Now, when, when Adrian will play, okay, when he hits the ball, you tell me, actually with which, uh, which position on the racket he's hitting. And you can say it yes for the middle or nothing for, or for everything else you say nothing. It's just yes for the middle. But when the ball, when you are hitting the ball, then you say hit. You, you remember, you know this hop hit drill? Okay, so that's a variation. So when I'm hitting, when I'm hitting I say hit, that I really hit my ball. And there actually I will say yes when I see that it's in the middle or nothing if I, don't, if I see it's outside, okay? Yes? Hit. No. Okay, I said even no. <laughs> if you want, you can say it. You can say yes or no, but here you can say hit when you see the ball on your racket. No, no, no. You always say hit when you're hitting. I want you to, be to see the ball. So say hit when you're hitting the ball. And yes? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. A bit louder. 
One more. Did you say anything? Stop. After four shots, already was a, b a bit like focus fading. It's not so simple to move the focus from one to the other element and to do it automatically. Typically, when we make one bad shot, we start to think what we did wrong with the racket or differently. Yeah? We are trying to coach ourselves. Hit. And say hit when you are hitting. Hit. No. Yes. Hit. Hit. Okay. Good. Can you come to me? By this last drill, can you come to me? How did you feel? Honestly, uh, honestly how do you feel? Does it uh, disturbs you or does it helps you? Helps. Helps. How? He said he helps, and I'm asking him how. Like, uh, I don't know, more exact shot. On more the exact? On the okay. Yeah. He feels that it helps him, that his contact point is better quality. How about you? What is your feeling? Does it help or is it disturbing? He doesn't feel that it helps and it disturbs. Actually, it's logical. And before I uh, actually also finish with the last two minutes with two slides. So, Gabor, can you get Gabor? Can they bring me back on my presentation? <laughs> it's, uh, it's there. Okay. Uh, I would like to thank to Zolan and uh, actually Attila for the help me helping me now. Thank you very much. Big hand. They will come again in the second presentation also. Thank you, guys. Can you pick up the ball, please? Yeah. Always the same, like in every practice. Uh, I don't like this. Then I have to move all the time. Anyway, I will finish without it. So, basically, with this what we what I was presenting to you today, I would I wanted to make you aware about this perception skills, about the clues that the players can use, actually for making decisions. Especially decisions are related to tactical element, but also the actually perception influence a lot technical elements that I was not emphasizing, especially in this one video clip with this young guy. So what I wanted to, uh, to actually say for the end is keep your awareness about it. If your players are showing you according to their level of the game and the age that they see the clues, don't do anything. Just make them perhaps practice it. But if they have a problem, have ready specific drills that will focus the attention on particular clue and bring it in relation actually with tactical elements and decisions that you would like them to make based on this. Thank you very much. And of course, we have 10 minutes for different questions. That was our actually agreement before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fervaya, for a great presentation. And I would like to start with the yep. first question and then let the uh, coaches ask uh, uh, if they have any questions. Well, first question I have is, what's your opinion, uh, young kids, how long can they really focus on these drills during one practice for 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes? How long can we push? Because obviously yeah. it's very uh, demanding yeah. on their, their uh, concentration. Uh, let's say when I said about this uh, with the, the pe pedal, uh, pedal racket, you can then two kids are working with you five minutes and that's it. Obviously because the range uh, of, of the concentration. When you are working with longer, uh, sorry, with all the players, actually of course you can extend. A good friend of mine, Goran Perfic, told me that sometimes he was practicing his fo uh, concentration when he was a professional player with hop hit, this hop bounce hit, uh, this uh, typical drill that we all know. Some, sometimes he said I was just doing this for 20 minutes, I, but that was more for me to really focus on the ball. Because at the end of the day, when you are playing the match, that's the most important thing. So 
Now, so I don't like to give only like a one minute or five minutes or ten minutes, but with some kind of the pause when we are practicing with two or three players, actually you can extend it easily to 20, 30 minutes because they have enough rest. But if you have a single lesson, let's say with uh, Zolan or Attila, when you're going up to five minutes, you need to make a break. But you can perhaps put it in a four times five minutes in two hours uh, session. But okay. if you are doing this intuitively, you can play a match and actually ask them to, okay, every time when you are able to create uh, this trouble bubble drill, that you create advantage in terms that the opponent has to hit here, you can play the whole set. Okay, so it's, okay. I am sorry if I didn't give you uh, only one I answer. I think everybody got a good okay. idea. Good. Okay, um, most már megnyitjuk a, a lehetőséget, hogy ti is kérdezzetek, uh, és arra kérnélek benneteket, hogy majd a mikrofon uh, mondjátok be a kérdést. Always the first question is the most difficult one, I know that. <laughs> Okay, while we're <laughs> waiting, let me ask you another <laughs> okay. question. Um, how about uh, differences between girls and boys? Do you see any differences there, or do you think we can do the same drills? Oh, it's a tough question. It's Only tough five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough question because uh, very often when you, are play when you are speaking to the coaches that are working with very good girls, even at the, uh, at the pro tour, they will tell you, don't mess around. Tell them what to do. Make uh, two, the two actually typical like uh, patterns. And don't ask for too much thinking. They will get lost in combat. For me, there are two things. Ladies, and I actually I believe that you are exactly the same, you have the same creativity as the men. <laughs> and we all know that. So I believe it's very important, especially at a young age, to actually develop I would say in the same way the boys and girls. We all know also that females are more under influence of the le left side of the brain with the emotions, so it's very important also to actually uh, help them in terms of uh, being confident. And th in this case, you have to be very careful how, you, uh, how many informations you are including in the decision-making process. So. Uh, after the age of 13, 14, I would uh, first of all look at my player. I would not teach everybody the same. I would look what my player is, has and then actually try to help him with some things that I find is crucial for the player. In terms of female or male, still I would l first I look individually. Okay, okay. thank you. Kedeshak? Still no question. Oh, now we have. Thank you. <laughs> Either it was so simple everybody understood, or I confuse you 100%. <laughs> so many of these, uh, these qualities you were, sh you were showing us uh, are teachable, obviously, but uh, the most talented kids do it just by playing and, and they, they mm -hmm. grow with the game. Uh, do you think the ones who, who don't have this, this special quality, they can be teached and they can uh, reach the same level as those who who born with this? I would say like everything, what, uh, like all abilities that we have, you have like a, like a genetic, I would call it potential, and you have ability to develop your potential. So obviously, if you are not having the Nadal genetics, it will be very difficult to just develop it by practicing. So yes, I believe strongly, but that's, uh, even the scientists are not 100% in agreement how much each of these abilities are genetically determined, but from our experience, yes, there are some kids that really just bring innate abilities that are already at very high level, but then if you don't work on them, they will not become perfect. Uh, I would like to use example of Usain Bolt. If Usain Bolt would play any sport, he would be really fast, and he would play, most probably he would uh, run 10 seconds, on 100 meters without being a sprinter, but 950 without being 15 years practicing this would not be possible if you would play football. So obviously specific practice makes you perfect. That's one part of the answer. But there is another one. 
and thank for this question. Uh, I was also asking myself, obviously, Nadal, Djokovic, Federer, none of these guys have been actually uh, working on these drills, actually. Yes, one thing is that they intuitively, I would say, and that for me is one part of talent ID. When you see the players that are intuitively looking for the right clues, that's one very good sign. Oops, this, this is a good guy. So he's intuitively looking for it. But there is one thing that is very much <coughs> depending on us as coaches. And that's the way we coach. Now, I hope that each of you had one like a really talented player in your career, but really like a top talented player. And actually compare now, how much did you speak about movements to this type of players compared to the regular players? What I want to say, when we have regular players, our 99% of teaching points, feedback, is actually aiming, bring a racket down, prepare your, your racket earlier, and actually with the talented players, you don't need to do this, so you don't do it. What is the consequence? Because for the talented players, we are not focusing them what they do with their body and racket, they have time to look there. But if you are all the time always focusing your feedback and your attention as a coach on bring your racket down, Basically, you are shifting the whole focus on player's body or what he's doing with his body part away from actually picking up other clues. Message? Yes, technique is important, but also for the regular players, there is also even more important to see all the other clues in order to, to play better. So try to balance with the regular players how much of your feedback and focus will be really on the movement and how much of your focus and player's focus will be on other clues. So I think this is also a very important thing that came to my mind when I was reflecting why top players do it intuitively. Because usually they're so talented that you, you don't speak too much about technique. No need. And with the regular players, we are focusing only on the movement, going away from the other stuff. Thank you. I hope okay. Thank you very much. Uh, még egy kérdéssel lesz lehetőség. One more question. Okay. If there is any. No. Then no. Hervey, thank you very much. You're uh, köszönjük szépen. Uh, most egy 15 perces szünetet fogunk tartani, és uh, 11 óra 15-kor folytatjuk. Köszönjük szépen. Thank you.